he's being made in the background uh, or, or, uh, or, or your phone's ringing or anything else. Um, questions for this event will be given in the text box. So if you have any questions as we go through, please feel free to pop them in the, in the text box and I will actually ask them as we get to the Q&A section. Um, and I guess, you know, first and foremost, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, just introduce myself. So many of you don't know me. Uh, my name is Brandon James and I am a marketing and branding. I get some people would, would call me an expert. I, I don't call myself that. Uh, I've known Matt for 10 years now. I started off as a client of Matt's and, and uh, Chris when they were running for peas. And uh, interestingly, I also have a, a small little place in the book, which I'm quite excited about where we get into the branding and marketing and happiness section. Um, you know, my thing is I'm one of those kind of annoying people you might meet who uh, backs themselves. So I am very much one of those people who is not afraid to fail. I love to try things that I'm not used to. Uh, I, for instance, I have never hosted a book launch in my life. So this is definitely going to be a first first for me. Matt asked me to do it. And I, I said, yeah, because I truly believe for me, the thing that makes me happy is being able to tell a fantastic story about something later. So I'm the guy who doesn't sleep on the plane because if the pilot passes out, I'm going to be the guy who's like, I can totally fly this plane if you tell me what to do. I will get us down safe. We might not live, but if we do, we're going to have an awesome story to tell about it. So I am absolutely that guy. Um, so I would just say, you know, I'm really excited to have you all here. We're going to have a, a, fantastic, uh, a fantastic session. I would like to take a moment just to let the guests, uh, our panelists, introduce themselves. So if you could unmute yourselves, panelists, please, and introduce yourself to all these lovely people. Hi, so I think I was first. Um, so my name is Jeremy Dawson. Uh, I'm a professor of health management at the University of Sheffield, and I've done a lot of research over the years looking at how uh, health service um, staff are managed, what makes them happy, what makes patients happy. Um, and so I'm going to be talking a bit about my research on that later. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Nicola Piercy. I am the outgoing president um, for UK and Europe for Lionsgate. We are a film and TV company, uh, quite significant in, in size these days. When I started at the company, we we had just started out in, in the UK and that was uh, 14 and a half years ago. So I've been very fortunate to have had an amazing journey with, with Lionsgate. And uh, I connected with Matt just over, um, and team just over a year ago. And we have uh, essentially in the UK introduced a Lionsgate voice, which has been a phenomenal platform, which is from the Happiness Index and has really helped the, the company to grow in my core focus, which has always been a people and profit first strategy. So I'll be looking forward to chatting further um, with Matt and Brandon and Jeremy on um, career happiness, uh, leading in the current pandemic, and also on happiness and success, which comes first. Good to see you all. Hey everyone, I'm Matt. Um, I've looked through the list and I know everyone here, so I don't need to introduce myself. Um, I would just, uh, disc I just before I forget later on, I just want to thank the core team um, that have worked on the book. Um, Simas helped us pull the data together. Elle helped us uh, craft some of my crazy sentences into something that actually makes sense. Um, and Susan, um, who has been an editor extraordinaire, who I would describe as more than an editor, like literally being co-founder of this book. And yeah, just a massive shout out to all the, there's so many contributors in the book um, and lots of them are on here. I can see Louisa Powell coming um, right in my top right hand of my screen. Um, but so many of you, oh, just spotted Margot and Clive. So, so many um, contributors and Jeremy and Nicola um, that I just want to thank all of them because it's a massive team effort. And I never wanted the book to be a book about me. I just wanted it to be a book about information that could empower people. So, yep, yeah, that's me. Thanks, Brandon. 
Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you all very much. And I'm so glad that you can share, you can all share your views and your professional expertise today. I know that lots of people are going to get uh, uh, so much out of it, including myself. Uh, I, I'd like to remind everyone of, of the running of, of, the, of the launch. But before I do, I'd just like to take a, a serious moment because I know we're running through, you know, lots of emotions with the election and everything else that's going on in the world. I, I'd just like to start by saying welcome to 2020. And I would like to declare victory now for this book launch automatically as a, as a, you know, we've, Matt, you know, we started down this journey, you wrote a book, it felt like you were writing a book and I feel like you've won. So, you know, I'm just going to say that is an automatic victory because we can do that now in 2020. Uh, just to take you guys through the agenda, you know, we're going to uh, have a bit of a Q&A uh, between myself and Matt. I've got a few questions I really want to dig into around this book and, uh, and find out a lot more. Uh, so we can get into it a, a bit more and get him to explain himself. And then Jeremy is going to take us through uh, his latest research, which is, is quite riveting. And I'm excited to hear him uh, take us through it. As, and then we're going to have a, a bit of a chat with myself, Nicola, Jeremy, and Matt. And we're going to talk around things like leading in the, in the current pandemic, uh, happiness and success, career happiness. You know, we're, we're going to kind of throw things around the room and, and see where they are and, and really try and, uh, and, and share as much knowledge as we can. And then uh, we're gonna do an audience Q&A. So if you, do have those, if you do have those questions, please feel free to put them in the text and we will read them out. And, and they can be anything, you know, if you, if you have something. So don't be afraid to ask Matt, since most of you know him anyway. It doesn't have to be about the book. I'll, I'll feel pretty excited reading those regardless. Uh, and, then, and then we'll have a close. So, you know, I think let's, let's just get right to it, Matt. Uh, you know, I, I have to know, you know, why freedom to be happy? What, what, what was that about? Oh, you're on mute. Quote of 2020. You're on I, mute. Wish, I, wish I'd, I, I wish I'd actually done that as a joke, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, Brad, how amazing is Brandon's voice? Like someone's got someone, I mean, there's some media people on here, got to be signed up for a, some kind of radio show, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but go on. Let's see. I'm not going to let you out of the question. Why freedom to be happy? Um, I, two reasons. There's, 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 there's research in the book that links um, freedom and happiness. Um, but it, it was also a very personal thing uh, for me. And it's, it's potentially why I'm um, an entrepreneur as well. So it, I, I just seek freedom in all my relationships. So if I was told to write a book, I would never write a book. If, um, if my wife was the type of person that checked up on me every second of the day, like, where are you? What are you doing? I, I wouldn't have married her. Um, and any time I've worked in places where the culture was really restrictive, I've left. Um, so for me, freedom is just, they're just, it's so linked to my own happiness. Um, which is why I added the business case bit on so people didn't think this was just some kind of like, uh, there's obviously a lot of great self-help books, but I'm definitely not qualified to write a self-help book. Well, I mean, so, so you mentioned, you mentioned a business case. I mean, you know, that, I think that's interesting. Can we get into that a little bit more? Like what, what made you come up with a business case? What, why that? Um, yes, I'm a bit, a bit weird in the fact that I actually like writing business cases. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the last chapter does actually give like, I can't remember how many tips, but like tips on how to write a business case. Um, but which, my, which is my own personal view. But what I realized in this particular area, um, there's a lot of ignorance to the science. Um, I don't mean ignorance in a bad way. I just mean people just don't know about it. Um, so if I, just, if I just read out um, or, or just say like, a lot of the books are around emotions and Two of, the, two of the things that are impaired if you don't allow people to be emotional at work are um, uh, problem solving and memory recall. So if you just take an example of that where you don't allow people to be emotional in a meeting, if, you, if there was something that stopped people having good memory recall um, and so on in a meeting, it'd be crazy to deny it. Um, so I just wanted to talk the, the science through so people could if they believe in this stuff, which a lot of people do, they've got all the evidence in one place um, where they, because when I, when I joined the happiness index, um, Tony and Pat gave me all the evidence, but it was all over the place. It was everyone's different research. Like they showed me Jeremy's stuff, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit, but which is amazing. But I just wanted to get it all into one place. So if anyone was making a business case, they could use the book and pick the bits out they wanted. 
I quite like that. That's a very, it's a very interesting approach and yet another uh, layer to the onion that is you. I didn't know that you really love to write business cases. So, um, <laughs> I'm a gate driver. Wonderful, weird fact. And I know who to come to next time because I absolutely hate writing business cases. So <laughs> I, know, I didn't know you had that. You've been holding out on me all this time. <laughs> I mean, you know, looking through the book, you know, it, 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 is, it is a very good book, by the way. I'm, I'm not just saying that, you know, because of being partially in it and, you know, and not because we're mates. It is genuinely a good book. I, uh, the thing I really enjoyed about it a lot was the fact that you write in your own voice. Uh, and maybe that's, I'm biased because I know, I know you, so I can read it in your voice. But, you know, it was definitely one of those things, you know, when I started to look at the areas where you talk about the very beginning where we're, we're kind of like Neanderthals and we don't know what happiness is. And you kind of take us on like a left turn all the way back to like the beginning of history to take us through when we finally start to find happiness on this journey, which I, which I thought I was, it was fascinating. I have to be honest. Um, you know, I could tell you really enjoyed writing it, but what did you enjoy most about writing this book? Um, just for answer that, a really random thing that I found out because I did my, I got my DNA back from 23 Me. And um, my, my genes are more Neanderthal than 98% of other people. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I'm, a, I'm basically a caveman. <laughs> That's a high compliment in my book. <laughs> Thanks, Minter. <laughs> I was devastated when I first read it, and then, but now I just, I'm, I'm wearing it as a badge of honor. Uh, what was the question again, Brad? Did I totally forget? I, just, I mean, you know, it's so interesting. I just, what was, what was your favorite part about writing this book? What, what did you enjoy most about writing it? Uh, that's really easy. That was just speaking to all the, um, doing all the research interviews. Because I, long story short, I did the first one. Um, and they're such fun conversations. I thought, I've got to release these as podcasts. And, and that, that, that was Minta Dahl, who's, who's been doing podcasts for years. Um, and, and, and they were, he does some amazing ones on empathy. Um, and I just thought, you know what, why am I, have, why am I keeping these conversations private? Um, and like Jeremy's going to talk in a bit, in a, in a bit, but some of the stuff that um, you find out by just asking someone, what is the most surprising thing you've found out? Um, it's just brilliant. And you just set people off and they, they, they just keep talking and going deeper and deeper in, into it. Like, and I've been banging on about like the soil research one in bacteria and serotonin and stuff, but it's just so fascinating. Um, so it's definitely obviously a niche subject. If you're not interested in human beings and human behavior and stuff, you're not really going to get into it. But just listen to all the experts just speak. Um, and I, I don't include the experts that are on here, but I also found out a really weird thing about academics. And I don't know if Jeremy's going to be like, I've never heard of this. But a lot of them said to me privately, and Jeremy didn't say this, but it's in some universities and places, it's almost frowned upon to promote your work. Um, that is, it's almost like you've, you do this amazing work and then it's, 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 it's special by, by sitting on the shelf and becoming undiscovered. And, and as an entrepreneur, like, I, I, I didn't have loads of money. So if I don't make money, my children don't eat. Um, so I just, I, I just, found it fascinating that there's just amazing research out there. And because as an entrepreneur, you're always promoting something, whether it's this book or your business. So it's like day in, day out. So then when you meet people that have got the most amazing research, it's just like unbelievable to think, how does, how does everyone not know about this? Like the only people who wrote about the blooming bacteria in soil serotonin study is the Daily Mail. <laughs> and, and like people read about it for about two minutes and it's been disappeared. Like every parent should know about that research. Um, but they don't. So I've just enjoyed getting all this research together and, and hopefully getting it out and, and people taking it on. I mean, I did, I did find that fascinating. And I would say to any, any of you here, definitely, definitely get the book, read the book, because that, that is a fascinating uh, a piece. I mean, you know, that I thought I found it a bit weird at the same time. There were several things that kind of jumped out at me. What, in all the research that you did in making this book, since you, since you did kind of go into the soil study, what was the weirdest thing that you, you kind of found out? What was the, what is the weirdest thing that stuck out to you? Um, I suppose, oh God, I mean, Jeremy's going to talk about the, um, the impact of um, discrimination and inequality on death rates, which is mental because, um, but I won't ruin all of his stuff. Um, but again, on that, on that soil research stuff, what I didn't realize is that, especially in this COVID area, it, we're, we're really obsessed with the bad stuff when we're with each other that we pass on. 
um, human to human, uh, pets to human, and so on. But we also pass on good stuff. So, uh, and, and, and Clive Highland, who's on here, had a, a massive impact on the, on the quantum chapter. And we talk a lot about um, us being energetic beings. Mm. But, and as, I always think there's that fine line between science and magic and as we're just uncovering stuff. But I just, I just keep looking at, at human beings and like just now when I look at other people, I wonder what microbes they're passing between each other. <laughs> but that's probably the weirdest thing. Like I, I view the world totally different. And but when I, it's so crazy how much of it goes into diversity because Jeremy's piece does and so does Christopher Lowry's. But Christopher's going through like the importance of diversity in your food and in your air. And, and, and you just start looking at things differently. Like I went to, um, after I did it, I went to the garden center and I spoke to the guy there and I hit up the um, discount plants. So you can get loads of out of season plants for like two quid from the garden center that were normally 15, 20 quid. So I've brought them all back and planted in my garden to get more diversity in my garden. But it just looks like I've got weeds everywhere. <laughs> so basically you're saying if we want to learn how to do bad gardening and become germaphobes, we should definitely buy this book. Is that yeah, what you're basically yeah, telling us? Okay. I, I should have put that on the back. Yeah, that, I think I think you've hit the <laughs> nail on the head there. I mean, you know, I mean, we, I, obviously that's not the goal of this book. Like, you know, what, what was the what was the what's the goal of the book? Not obviously gardening or turning us all into germaphobes, clearly. Um, I suppose the goal of the book is to start. I don't, I don't want this to be my book or this be to be my thing. It's just a light of fire underneath all of this stuff um, so that people realise that you don't have to choose uh, between treating people well and a financial decision because that's what people have got stuck in their heads. They think it's like you've got a hard business person over here that's like, I'm all business, I'm going to make loads of money. And then you've got like a bunch of hippies over here that are interested in, in happiness and so on. I just want people to see that actually that a really smart business person is going to treat their employees really well. And it's not just a moral thing. It's actually good. It makes complete sense so that it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an argument. Um, and, and at least the research is there because I probably meet about a hundred CEOs a year. And I would say they break down into three camps. One, one uh, people like Nicola, um, who's going to speak in a bit, who just get this stuff intuitively. Um, then you get your, especially ones that have come from a finance background, um, they will get it if you show them the data. And, and then you do have your third of Donald Trumps out there that are just, they're just never going to buy into this stuff. Um, so you just, it's fine, just leave it. It's not a problem. Um, but, it, but the reason I got you on branded on, on, onto the book is because I think we talk about, I don't know if we talk about it in the book, but bad customer service is like a, an immediate punch in the face. If you get bad customer service, it's reported back and you can fix the customer service. But sadly, um, bad company culture is like a really slow death from a cancer. So it can be impacting companies for years, but you don't really notice it. Just good people leave, even worse, people stay, but they're not engaged. Um, and it's like a slow death of a business. Um, so I just the, the, the goal was just to get all this research in one place. So, and, and also, you know, people talk a lot about like, especially with the election today, like around what's true from what's not. Um, I, I only believe that data is true in that second. So there's a whole chapter on the happiness index data um, around what makes people happy and so on. But I'm not trying to say this is the definitive guide to it. This is just what made people happy in that test with half a million employees at that time. And the context around all that changes as we go. So I just wanted to inspire people to try and start their own research as well. So I get annoyed with people that um, throw stones at people living in glass houses. Like if you disagree with someone's research, like if, if Jeremy speaks later and you think oh, that was a load of rubbish, I liked his COVID haircut, but I didn't like his research. <laughs> um, then, then perhaps why don't you set up your own tests or, or maybe contact Jeremy and say, oh, do you know what? I've got some more data that we could put into the mix here rather than just criticizing. So I just wanted more people to get into the, the idea of looking at stuff, experimenting, getting data in it, and, and, and help you bring out um, more, of a, more of a conversation on it. I mean, I think, you know, uh, it, 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 it's spot on. I, I think it's a, it's a noble goal. And, uh, you know, I, I'd love it to, to create more conversations because I think, you know, it's something that we are talking about a lot more now uh, as we go, you know, in the world, you know, company culture is, is so important. How we treat each other is so important and happiness 
is, is extremely important. Some of the things that you have in the book, which I quite liked, um, are a little bit controversial as well. You know, when we start talking about emotion and, and uh, you know, emotions and how they're allowed or they should be allowed in the workplace, being emotional. Uh, and, you know, I know there are lots of people that, that may not agree uh, or they may take it a different way. You know, knowing that you would have to be yourself and, and take a stand on that, what would you say was the hardest part about writing this book? Was there ever a period where you, you came across something that you thought, you know what, this is, uh, this is, this is pretty close to the bone and I'm just going to leave it out. I'm, I'm not going to touch it. Um, there's, there's a personal one. There's two personal bits. There's one, um, I'm really, I suppose you grow up like learning about like the British empire a lot in, in British schools. And I'm always really worried that our vision, freedom to be human, might be like a modern version of imperialism where we're saying, oh, let's bring, let's bring democracy to this country. So I'm always like, when we go to countries like China, I'm always worried about like preaching. Um, we want to get our message and our data out there. But when I wrote the China chapter, so just to be really clear, in our database, the happiest employees in the world are from China. Um, and I would say, especially considering we're at, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement, I would say where I live in London, the, the most amount of racism I hear um, or xenophobia is about Chinese people. Um, that, that's the thing that I, as a white person, I hear the most. Um, so right in the, the bit about China, was I felt it was a real delicate balance because I've been there and worked there. I see a totally different China to the, that you read on, um, on the BBC. So I'd, I'd recommend the Serene Tan, who, was, who used to be our CEO in China. She's a CEO in Singapore now, who talks about uh, 966. So for those that don't know, uh, 966 is that you um, work from uh, 9 a.m. to 6 uh, p.m. Uh, six days a week. And it's like it's in the uh, Chinese tech companies that they do. And it's criticized sometimes. Um, but... You can look at it from a Western view, but also I think you've got to get out to countries and speak to people and see how they view it. Because in some of those countries, in some of those companies, they give you a house at the same time um, and so on. So, uh, and I've also, whenever I'm in China, I'm very aware of the news that, that, that they have been, that they have, that is reported that they are locking up Islamic people um, and uh, what they call re-educating. Um, so I wanted to put that in there. So I did put the BBC report in there because my experience of China is really positive. Um, and the first time we went there with the, with the vision of freedom to be human, Matt Stannard and I went, we, we thought we might get arrested speaking to people about freedom in China. And um, it was a complete opposite. Um, and I loved being there and I felt really safe and employees feel really happy. And, and the, re the reason a lot of them want to work with the happiness index is because they want to have an independent um, data to be able to say, actually, this isn't how we treat our employees. But I did want to make sure, and I spoke to Susan, my editor, about that. Does this, I wanted to leave in the stuff about the Islamic camps and not take it out um, for fear that the book might get banned in China. So I thought, I'm just going to forget uh, book sales and think if someone in China wants to buy this book and see both sides of the opinion, they can. So that, that's the first, that, that was the first point on um, what was the hardest, which is not to be like an imperialist with our freedom to be human. And the second bit was, um, and there's a few authors on here, is like I say my number one role has been a dad. Um, but when you write a book, I was on my laptop like seven days a week. Um, so my, my, my children, I am conscious that they have just, uh, I have pushed them back a lot. Um, so the book's about, ha the irony is the book's about happiness, but I've pushed it too far for the last three months. So I couldn't be, be doing a day job and writing a book for too long. Otherwise, I'd I generally think I'd lose my connection with my children. Um, so balancing writing a book and work um, and the happiness index guys have been brilliant. I haven't been to an internal meeting for four weeks, um, <laughs> which is quite cool, but I do actually miss everyone and I get my energy from the team. Um, but it's definitely their work and um, the balance um, with my children has, has been tough. And I, I, as of, as of next week, I'm going to feel like I'm a, like a proper dad. Well, I mean, you know, that, I mean, that, <laughs> it's a, it, it's quite a comprehensive answer and I do appreciate you taking so much time to really lay that out for us. I mean, you know, it sounds like, you know, you have sacrificed quite a bit at least to get through the point of, of getting this book out there, but 
I mean, I, I, do, I do have one final really important question for you. I, I hope it doesn't offend you too much. Um, will you write another book? Uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've, um, I, I did the launch with the team yesterday. So one thing I'd say to everyone on here, um, and Elle's laughing because Elle's been through most of the pain with me, um, um, is that I'm encouraging my team uh, to write a book. Um, and I've just said to everyone yesterday, um, I would recommend anyone on here to write a book, even if you don't publish it, because the deep research that you have to do for a book just makes you more of an expert on your subject. Um, and I just love, I love my subject, but actually spending the time meeting people like Jeremy that I, if I hadn't have got, I've gone out to write the book, I probably wouldn't have been, had the justifiable time to email Jeremy and say, can we have a conversation? Um, but I'm better and understand my subject better for that. So I'd recommend everyone to write a book. I know I'm not answering your question yet, Brandon. Um, just to become a deeper, um, deeper understanding. But my main goal now is to encourage potentially someone else within the Happiness Index to write one. Um, but I would. I've written. Um, I have written um, some children's books when my daughter was really young. Um, but I've never had a chance to like get them out in the world. But um, so I probably will, but right now it's just like when you've just finished your exams, is it, it was, was it Stephen Redgrave when he won that gold and he was like, if anyone ever sees me getting a vote again, shoot me. So I'll, I'll, I don't want to answer it because I'll probably say if, if I write another book, shoot me, but um, it, I probably just need to get to Christmas and then spend a bit of time with my kids first. I think that's completely fair. I think you've been very game. So thank you very much for, for answering uh, the questions and going into so much detail. I uh, really appreciate it. It's, it's fascinating stuff. And, uh, you know, again, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I, I highly urge you uh, to do so. Uh, I'm going to just uh, move on then. And I'm, I'm going to invite uh, Jeremy Dawson, our expert, expert on COVID cuts and teamwork uh, to pre present his latest research, uh, which I've been looking forward to. So Jeremy, I'm gonna pass over to you. Thank you very much, Brandon. Just making sure I'm not on mute. Um, I honestly say that I never expected my haircut to get quite so many mentions in the, uh, uh, in the first few minutes of this launch, but uh, uh, I'm glad it's drawing attention to something. Um, I've just checked, Jeremy, it's, it's trend you and Donald Trump are trending on Twitter at the moment. <laughs> Well, that's company that I never thought I'd be keeping either. So, um, yeah, I, a few of you have, uh, well, Brandon uh, and Matt in particular, have trailed a bit of what I'm going to be uh, talking about. And really, uh, when Matt approached me um, in the summer and uh, wanted a conversation, uh, uh, it was just fascinating for me to hear about all the other stuff that, that Matt's been um, researching and writing about um, because uh, as, as academics we're so ingrained in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis that we sometimes forget to look outside and see what else is going on um, and I think that's probably the root of what you were talking about with the, the, the problem with academics there Matt actually it's a I would say that the university um, that I work for is very strongly um, inclined to trying to get get our research out there and get it known um, but actually the mechanisms for doing that aren't always straightforward um, and uh, it can certainly really help when uh, when there are occasions like this so I can talk about it to an audience that wouldn't normally hear um, what I'm talking about. The, the audience that would normally hear what I'm talking about is uh, people in the health service in the NHS because uh, that's where the majority of my work is based and for the last 20 22 years now, I think I've been doing work which looks at how NHS staff are managed, what that does for their well-being, uh, but also what it does for the outcomes for patients. Um, and so, um, and I'm not sure it, I, whether the uh, the slides that I sent um, I need to myself or whether Jeremy, I'll share I'll share my screen now and I'll let you talk through it. Brilliant, thank you, Rosie. Yeah. Um, so um, one of the key questions uh, that I've been uh, trying to understand in recent years is, is what actually makes a difference to patients? What are the things that make patients happy? 
And what it turns out is that most of the things that make patients happy are the same things that make staff happy. There's a huge correlation between staff experience and patient satisfaction. Um, and what we're seeing on screen now is just some of those things that are fundamental um, to that. So this is looking at all of the particular experiences that staff have at work, experiences of different management practices, experiences of different situations, and um, seeing which of those are the most related to patient satisfaction. Um, and what we found when we did this is that um, the number one thing um, affecting patient satisfaction is the work pressure that staff are under. Um, that probably won't be uh, a surprise to many people and certainly um, in this year when the NHS is so affected by COVID, um, that's being amplified uh, to a huge degree. But this is data from a few years ago now, and we saw it then too. Um, if staff are under too much pressure, they can't do their job, then patients suffer as a result. Um, that, as the number one thing, was of little surprise to anyone I've spoken to. But the next two most important predictors were probably more surprising. Not surprising that they're related, but that they were so strongly related ahead of some other things. And these were the perceptions that there are equal opportunities for staff in the workplace, regardless of their background. And also the extent to which staff experience discrimination, either from patients or the public, um, or from their colleagues or managers. And in, in particular, it's the discrimination that is faced from colleagues and managers, which is the, the, the single biggest uh, problem here. So Matt was talking a bit about diversity and I'll say a little bit more about how this relates to other outcomes in a few minutes. But as someone who has um, for many years been a, a a researcher in the area of diversity and uh, I've been trying very strongly to um, work out how we can really make the best use of the diverse workforce that we have both in the NHS and elsewhere. This was simultaneously um, a real concern but also a real opportunity um, because if we know it's this important to patients how much more important is it going to be to staff? And the answer is very, it's the single most important predictor of staff well-being we found ahead of particular management practices, ahead of particular relationships with managers, for example, um, even ahead of things like bullying and harassment. It's the single biggest predictor, uh, or these two are the single biggest predictors. So. I, this took me back a bit to some research that, uh, and I think this is the research that Matt first um, saw uh, that we uh, we did a few years ago, linking the engagement of NHS staff with outcomes. Now, engagement uh, is a term used in different ways by different people. In the NHS, it's framed um, in three different ways. It's framed as the um, the motivation that staff have to do their job, um, the involvement that they have whilst doing that job, involvement in things like decision making, being able to be proactive, um, and also the extent to which they are happy to speak up for their organisation, um, either as a place to work or as a place to receive treatment uh, if they're working in a hospital, for example. And between them, these three things contribute to what's been called for the last 12 years, the NHS staff engagement measure. Um, and we've seen that engagement is a really, really good barometer of how a particular organisation is doing overall. Um, let me give some um, examples of that. So um, Matt mentioned death rates earlier. Engagement is linked to patient mortality. Um, and this is a surprisingly big link, actually. Um, so a, a one standard deviation increase in engagement. Now, what that means for anyone who's not up on their statistics, that means sort of taking it from a, a, an NHS organisation, which is right slap bang in the middle, really average, to one which is 
probably about um, the 80th percentile, so just above the, um, the quarter mark. Um, so going from about, about, about the 50th percent to the 80th percent, roughly speaking, in terms of different organisations. So still very much within the mainstream. Um, a shift of that much is associated with a shift of 2.4% in patient mortality. Now, 2.4% might sound like a small, small number until you start to think about how many deaths there are in uh, a typical NHS organisation. In an average NHS trust, that's a roughly 52, 53 deaths a year. So uh, a relatively normal difference in engagement is linked to 50 or so extra people being saved or dying if going the other way every year just in a single NHS trust and there are about 150 of these trusts across England so we're talking about really quite significant numbers here. Um, that's, that's a correlational link we can't say with any certainty that if you change engagement then fewer people will die um, but it seems likely that there will be um, some causal link within that. Um, something that we can say with much more certainty uh, in a causal way is the link with staff absence. Um, again, a one standard deviation change in engagement is associated with roughly 2,000 fewer sick days in an average NHS trust, uh, in a year that is. Now, 2,000 sick days, these are large organisations, what does that equate to? Well, um, in terms of the extra spend that um, NHS trusts make on agency staff, that's associated with about a £1.7 million saving. So we're already talking about millions of pounds for each individual NHS trust. These are not... Um, negligible figures. These are things that really do make a difference to patients, they make a difference to organisations and critically they, they make a difference to staff as well. Um, so it's worth thinking about how can we get better engaged staff? What is it that enables us to um, increase engagement? And when I've been thinking about this recently, I've gone back to um, a particular uh, theory in organisational psychology um, called self-determination theory. This is not my own work. This is um, work uh, um, particularly of uh, researchers called DC and Ryan in the US. Um, and according to their theory, there are three fundamental things that humans need to be able to function well. Um, sometimes called the ABC of, um, of self-determination. The A is autonomy or control. So people need to have a sense that they can make a difference. Um, the B is belonging or relatedness. People need to feel that they belong as part of their organization or as part of their team, um, or even as part of society. Um, sorry, just responding to that question. The slides, um, don't need moving on just yet, but they will be very shortly. Um, the, uh, the C um, is about competence. So people need to feel that they're able to do what they um, are trying to do, what they want to do. Um, and those three things are, are, are fundamental, not just within the workplace, outside it as well, but particularly in the workplace. This has been shown to be a highly relevant theory. And one of the best ways in which enabling, uh, sorry, one of the best ways to enable these um, characteristics uh, is by team working. And uh, if you can move the slide on now, um, because team working is something that uh, is spoken about a huge amount. Um, over 90% of people in the NHS say that they are working in a team, um, but actually far fewer than that work in what um, we think of as a real team or an authentic team, because a, a, a real authentic team should have all six 
of these characteristics. Um, the team needs to have clear shared objectives. Um, team needs to have some autonomy. It needs to meet frequently to discuss how it's doing. It needs an identity as a team so people know who is within the team and who isn't. Uh, it needs uh, the working within the team to be interdependent so people aren't just working by themselves but working with others. And it needs everyone in the team to know what their own role and the roles of other people uh, are to, uh, to enable that. So these are things which a lot of research has shown to be pretty fundamental. Actually, in the NHS, we see only about 40% of people are working in teams with even the three biggest of these characteristics, the objectives, the meeting frequently and the interdependence. And this is a real problem, as we'll see on the next slide, because um, we can see that engagement is strongly linked to team working. Um, when people are working in authentic or real well-structured teams, um, engagement levels are far higher. And we think this is because they have those, uh, the, the ABC, the uh, autonomy, the belonging and the competence, uh, which is instilled within the team working environment, but only within a proper team environment. If people are working in groups that they say are teams, but actually don't display those characteristics, these are um, what are uh, often referred to as pseudo teams. Um, and in those situations, the engagement levels are lower than for people who don't work in teams at all. So not only do you not get the benefits of team working for increasing engagement, it actually works the other way. And we see all kinds of other um, problems associated with that as well, uh, including increased error rates, we see um, increased turnover. Uh, we see uh, increased incidence of sickness amongst staff. Um, and we also see uh, more particular uh, poorer outcomes for patients. And on the, uh, the next slide, we can see the, uh, how this works. It's a slightly complex graph. It's a sort of graph that as a, someone with a statistical background, I love to, to show and um, realize that actually until people are used to seeing this kind of thing it probably doesn't make a lot of sense so let me just explain this to you um, what we see here is um, that as real team working increases um, we also need to see the incidence of pseudo team working decrease to really make the uh, the best benefits of this but when we see both of those things happen patient mortality is that much lower and to give you a, a figure on this a 10% increase in real team working. So, for example, that's going from about 40% of people working in real teams to about 50% and a corresponding drop in people working in these pseudo teams. That's associated with a drop of around 6% in patient mortality. And again, in an average hospital trust, that's over 100 deaths a year. These are things that we can't ignore. The, these are things that show how important it is that the conditions are right for staff to be happy, for patients to be happy. Um, and team working is one of the, 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 the key ways in which um, that happens. But I just want to finish um, by going back to what uh, I was saying a little bit earlier uh, about diversity and particularly in terms of discrimination and equal opportunities. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the single biggest predictor of staff well-being and it's the second biggest predictor of patient satisfaction. But as Matt mentioned, it's also linked to uh, patient mortality. Um, and uh, this I find quite astonishing. E even as a diversity researcher, I find this quite astonishing. Um, in an average trust, a 1% increase in people saying that uh, their organisation it basically it treats their staff fairly, a 1% increase, so it's going from 70% to 71%, that's associated with a 0.4% a drop in mortality. Again, sounds like a small figure. That's about nine deaths a year in an average NHS trust. Now, 
there are all sorts of reasons behind this. It may not be entirely causal, but it's something that I think we can't ignore. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back to, to Brandon. Um, thank you very much for that, Jeremy. That was, uh, that was, that was really uh, quite riveting. Um, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at the, especially the last point you were making, the, the discrimination piece and, and uh, you know, people feeling valued and, and how that would make a change to mortality rates. Uh, it, it, it raises a lot of additional questions that I'm sure uh, I can have a virtual coffee with you about and discuss at a later date. Uh, but I, I it, it was very, uh, yeah, it, it was very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Please stay, stay with us, Jeremy. Uh, I'm gonna bring Matt uh, on and also uh, bring Nicola um, on as well uh, so that we can have a bit of a chat about leadership. And, uh, you know, Nicola, are you there? I am. Thank you. I just wanted to welcome you. Um, you know, thank you for, for stepping in. I know you've had to be quiet while we've all, you know, made lots of noise all this time. So we're definitely going to take some time and get into it. Um, you know, really fascinated with your background as well. Um, you know, the, the leadership piece is, is super important uh, to me and, and the, the career happiness uh, side, I guess, is, is, is also really important to me as someone who has worked in, I think, almost every industry except betting and uh, tobacco. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, having touched so many different industries looking for, for happiness and, and finally settling on a wellness company where I am now, um, you know, I'm, I would like to start that off with just those two words. I'd just like to start off with career happiness. Good question. <laughs> um, and I think it's been um, touched upon already by, by uh, Matt, Jeremy and yourself, Brandon. Um, and can I just say, Jeremy, that was amazing to hear. It's so, so powerful and so impactful. Um, and for me, the first question that I have coming out of that is how many people have visibility of that, that data and those insights to then be able to have a bigger impact? Um, and that's, that's something that comes down to career happiness from my perspective, which is that I, I always like to be able to have the ability to question. I'm a very curious leader. I'm a creative leader. Um, and I'm someone that, um, and I'm, which is perhaps where the connection with Matt came from, has that what is very important to me is the ability for myself and my staff always in whatever role I've been in to enable them to have autonomy, which is Matt's word, which is his book, which is about freedom. <laughs> Um, because that for me is what enables people to grow, enables them to give them the space to be able to question, to be able to have an element of control, to be involved, to be engaged in, in what they do. Again, a massive word for Jeremy, and I love, I love the ABC that you refer to. I think that's really impactful in a, in a succinct fashion. Um, so look, I was in, there was one role I was in that I didn't love many years ago and it wasn't um, because of the people in fact it was because of, of the lack of people so um, it, essentially I knew um, deep down very quickly that I was in a role that actually I was rather I was very successful at it in a short space of time it was a it was a selling role uh, but what came to fruition for me was that I wasn't with people enough to be able for them to have an impact on me and me to have an impact on them. And I knew that's something that I thrived upon. And that's what actually very quickly um, led for me to look into, into other roles and, um, and kick-started a, a change in, in career. So I think the first thing, and a vital thing, I realise it's not always achievable for everyone, but... We spend so much of our lives working that to be happy in the workplace for me is vital. It's something that I promote with, with my staff. If I feel or that they aren't able to um, thrive in what they're doing, then we discuss it and I'll help them, try to help them to fit them in the right roles. Or if it isn't within the company that I'm, I'm running or in a, you know, a team that I'm overseeing at that point in time, then encourage and help them to move on to their futures because I feel it's it's vital. It's a vital part of your life is your work environment and what you do within work. It's harder now more than ever to, to shut off. So your 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 twenty four seven your life is is very much influenced by work and by home. So it's important for me to enable people to be 
um, to be supported, to, to help them thrive on their journeys. And that's what has driven career happiness for me. Very I mean, much. I mean, that is, um, you know, when I, when I look at that and, I, and some of the things I took out of there, you know, it's, it's some of the things in, in my career that I've always lived by, you know, coming, coming from the States and, you know, uh, growing up in a place that was, um, maybe not the most uh, friendly to, to people of different races in the area where I grew up. Um, you know, I've always told people that I, I've only succeeded in my career because people have helped me. You know, people have, have seen something in me and they've decided I'm going to give this guy a shot. And then, so as a result, I've always done the same for everybody else because I help, but you know, someone, that's the only way anyone's ever going to get a chance. And like hearing you say that is, is quite heartening, you know, that you would, you would look at someone and say like, let's find you the right team. If it's not working, not you don't work, leave. Let's see if we can find a different way to, to focus your energy. And, that, and that's quite inspiring to hear, you know, from, from a leader, you know, one thing you also pointed out was about freedom and, you know, and, and I know Matt's probably going to have a, a thought on this as well. You know, the, the point, I, I guess a question I want to ask is, you know, when lots of people hear the word freedom uh, or autonomy, Usually in many, uh, you know, quite some senior people's minds, the word disruption, disruptor is kind of the, the word that's really in their mind. I mean, Matt, do you, you have a thought on that, you know, uh, a take on that? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's where we, in, in, in the last chapter, which is heavily influenced by Clive Highland, um, Tony Latta, Jackie Dial, um, and Gemma Shambler, which is what we call the quantum organization. Um, and the analogy we use is that um, the, you have to see your vision like the sun that gives you your energy and power. And then that, that pulls everyone in that direction. So pe when people think about thinking about autonomy from a traditional point of view, they think, oh my God, it's going to be chaos. Everyone's just going to be sitting around, not doing anything. Everyone's just going to be off having coffees and not doing any work. The reality is good people um, in a company with purpose, they want to be there and they do want to work because it is this thing like engaged people become happier and happier become engaged. So that's why we talk about what we call quantum organizations. Um, because if you move to giving people like what Nicola is saying in an organization that doesn't have strong values and a strong vision, it will be chaos um, because people will just be running around doing um, random things. Um, but if, you're, if, if you've got a strong vision that everyone understands and buys into, then they work towards it. So you don't have to do the command and control. So I think command and control is really a symptom of where you haven't articulated the vision. And, and the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to change the vision or the mission or the values. Like if you, if you read your own statement and you are falling asleep as you read it, get, get everyone together. Think, think about it. Think about it as your energy source and think, is this giving us energy? Like freedom to be human means... It's not just a marketing statement to people that have happiness index. It's like, it's the very reason we get up every morning. Um, and it puts people off. Like some people will hear that and think, I don't want to work for the happiness index. But for every one of those, there's so many people who contact us that are like, I, I just want to be part of this. And they don't even know what job they're applying for. They just message. We just get messages saying, can we come and work for the happiness index? Yeah, we want to be happy. <laughs> That's brilliant. But I think what you're saying, Matt, is that it, it may create levels of disruption but if people have that level of meaning and purpose in what they're doing then it's not going to be chaotic but in fact it will help drive more curiosity and creativity and for us at Lionsgate as storytellers that is where the IP generation comes from that is where the excitement comes from and in that ability and there's always that desire look so many people have come to work into to our company because they have a passion for film and tv but they may be in a finance role, they may be in a legal role, but it doesn't mean that they don't have ideas of what that, what the next great Hunger Games may be. Or um, So it's trying to enable them, which is why we set up this um, uh, group called the Imaginarium, was that it enables every single employee to come up with ideas without restrictions, without barriers. And that's that's what it should be about, in, in my opinion, that enables to help people, people to grow, to help find their own flow. Um, and, and for us to create or find the best stories to be able to, to share, to share with audiences that is around the world. I mean, with like, you know, it's something you guys get, we, we talked about autonomy and, and it, it keeps kind of jumping into my head and I keep looking at Jeremy. I mean, Jeremy, uh, 
an autonomous team, autonomous teamwork. Is that, is that a thing? Can, can, can that be a real thing? <laughs> Absolutely. It, it depends on the particular context of the team, of course, as to what that autonomy means. So within the health service, you can't have a team of nurses, which is going to be completely determining the way that it works from start to finish. There are, um, there are protocols, there's evidence, there's, um, uh, the practices that need to be followed um, in order to keep things safe. But within that, there are still things that teams can decide for themselves. Even if it's things like, um, you know, rotors, um, the, the ability of s staff within the team to determine their own work rotors is something that isn't, uh, isn't universal, but that can easily help. Um, but then also um, things like, uh, a lot of the best innovations will come from those people who see what's really going on. And if people say, well, hold on, if, if we changed this particular operating theater around so that you know, patients came in from this way, this would have this effect. The sort of thing that the senior managers might not necessarily think about um, or see. Um, but actually, sometimes these things can make a huge difference uh, to people's working lives and to, uh, and to the patients as well. Uh, yeah, and I, I think you're right, Jeremy, and that's where it, to me, it's about enabling people to ask more questions. It's not just finding those right answers, which I know it's a Drucker thing. It's how Gregor's massively into this. But it's uh, if you enable more people within your company to be able to ask more questions rather than just finding the right answers, then actually you should lead to a much better direction and to better results ultimately. And I love Nicola's point because it, it links back to trust and, and, and why we've got why the happiness index in our models, we've got rid of what some people call high performance culture, because high performance culture can quickly slip into a competitive culture. And everyone's been in one of those meetings where you think you're trying to solve the problem, but then you realize someone's just trying to win the argument, which is just not helpful. You just you just want to find out what the best answer is and get to that point. And unless you've got that environment where people trust each other, you're going to end up with that weird thing where everyone's trying to like outdo them in the meeting, which is just, it's not good for anyone. Yeah, I think the, the thing you normally get is the, I absolutely agree with you, Matt. And what I would add to that after adding on to what you said, which is far better than what you said. <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right. I, it's one of the things that we, we do face in, 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 our, in our culture and it, it does become quite competitive in that way. I mean, now that we're in this crazy world, you know, where we're all looking at each other from a computer screen uh, and we're, you know, and I, I do find even more now in, in organizations, people wanting to be even more competitive because, you know, they're, they're not getting that face time that they normally would, you know, they're getting their energy maybe from sources that aren't uh, the typical places they would get them, you know, even things like the commute or just the, that relaxation of, of, of shedding work. I mean, Nicola, I got to come to you for this. You know, what do you feel that we could do in the current situation to, to, to manage happiness, especially with, with work being the way it is? Um, I think, um, look, from a, from a leadership during the pandemic in this current world that we're they're living in, there's someone who I think is amazing, a lady called Lucy Hon. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's um, um, very, she's focused on resilience. She's out of uh, New Zealand um, and she's, she's, she's super impressive. And she has gone, she went through some extremely challenging times um, after having focused, um, studied in, in resilience and realized that she, she decided to use herself as a case study after, the, after losing her young daughter. Um, and and her her story and her messaging is is so impressive and it's something that I've kind of reiterated to myself or people are around me who are just trying to come to terms whether it's redundancies whether it's just coping with the pandemic but essentially she boils it down to three secrets of resilience and one is um, that you know excuse my language but shit happens right we we all suffer from something at some point in time so actually she starts with one of her ted talks with everybody stand up if you have suffered from xyz all these things and and most of the room is standing up and it's just coming to terms and acknowledging that things happen and it's then in helping because you know so often on instagram wherever it is we often see this shiny world that people are portraying that everything's very rosy and therefore for so many youngsters today which is why I'm trying to study more on, on mental health and young people. 
there's this perception that the world is, you know, that, that people live these very perfect lives. So actually the acknowledgement firstly of th that things will happen, like suffering does not discriminate, but you, you learn to come to terms with the fact that you will at some point suffer if you haven't already is, is one point. And from that, it's then as an individual, how do you choose to um, select where your attention is on for yourself, like focus on what you can change. So my team are probably very sick of me by now on the whole point of saying that you focus on the things that you can, you can change, right? Is that you, you don't go beyond that control, the controllables. And in doing that, it's those little things that enable you to, to continue forward. Um, it's very easy for us as, and again, she'll talk about, she talks about this is that as, as humans, the bad things, you know, stick to you. And a lot of the positive, they just bounce off. And that's just, again, back to, back to uh, caveman times, <laughs> Matt, you'd know well. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. but, that's a she's, stick, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, but essentially, she's saying, you know, it's, it's, it's you, you do, I'm saying to my team, you control the controllables, and that's what you can influence. So I push them to deliver, whether it's presentations or new products or things that they can control to enable them to improve and grow from those because there's so much bigger stuff happening outside of that, that those are the things that can scare you. But you can't impact those right now. So if you focus on those smaller things, then it's possible to then act in ways that can help you build your own resilience, help you build your hope. And that's a big thing. Hope is a massive factor in, in all of this. And the third point is, is, is what I'm doing, is that really helping or hindering myself? So think about all the things that you go through through your day. Um, and it may be that I'm watching the news, I'm getting het up about this situation, or I'm reading so much about the pandemic, but is that helping me? Maybe it's helping because I feel more comfortable about having more research, so I feel more knowledgeable. Or the flip side may be that it's just overload. So you've got to really hone in on and be kind to yourself as an individual to go, do you know what, that is, that's helping me actually. Doing that little thing to help someone else here or speaking to a friend here or connecting with people is helping you to take back that, that bit of control again and to help, and to help you to continue to, to build that hope. So, you know, I've, I've done the, um, the, with my family, I've just restarted and I thought I'd do through the whole of lockdown that what three good things have happened to you today. So did it with my kids last night. And oh my God, it was so cute. Um, so my, my four year old son was like, oh mommy, I helped save my friend because she fell out of a tree. Um, <laughs> she was like, that made me feel so good. And I was like, Dawson, that's amazing. So we've written them down and we're gonna do that for the whole of lockdown because actually it's a brilliant way for them to share their stories as well and just to think back on their day. But reminding themselves of those things the good things, the gratitude, it all helps build your, your resilience, that positivity for hope and impacts then your ability um, to manage, manage this situation and know actually the little things actually build up to much bigger things. So that's what I've been trying to do during, you know, in, in leading people during this time. At the same time as obviously trying to deliver company results, but actually if you make people feel better, they will help you drive your results. And from my perspective, it's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think that, you know, uh, sorry, I was looking at uh, Matt. I thought you were going to jump in. Sorry, Matt. No, I, I, I was, Brian. I was just going to add um, to what Nicola was saying, because obviously I work with Nicola and I've observed the way that she works and the way uh, Gemma, our head of people work. And it's also a learning for ourselves around I've seen both Nicola and Gemma use data um, to improve the workplace. So they're continually listening to how their people feel, but they don't shy, they, both of them don't shy away from bad stuff. Um, and quite often people try to use data to present a good story about everything that the leadership's doing. But I think it's really important when you see bad stuff in data to front it up. Otherwise your employees feel like you're gaslighting them because if you feel crap, um, but then the company's like, oh, we've just won best companies to work for. This is such an amazing place to be. It, it, it just, you start to question your own reality. You think, uh, am I going crazy here? Yeah. Um, yeah. And what we did, what um, we recommend on that now is, and this is our own learning and me just sharing, is that we've taken out our own happiness targets. So we don't have a target at the happiness index. It used to be, we want our employees to be eight, eight out of 10 happy. 
Um, but now we just see it as just an observation of what's going on so that we can create more empathy. And I'm really, uh, I'm friends with a guy called Justin Cochrane. The reason I'm friends with him is because he plays for my football team. Um, but he's also an ex-professional footballer, so he makes me look really good. Um, <laughs> but I, I asked him the same question. I wanted to know whether this stuff that people like Jeremy is talking about applies in football, because I'm a football fan. Um, and a lot of when people see the Happiness Index, they talk about things like Moneyball, um, which is a great film with Brad Pitt and so on. Um, but I was talking to him about data that they use. So he coaches um, the England under-16s football team. So he's one of the very few black uh, coaches um, in the game. Um, and he was talking about um, a, a stat called pass completion. So if anyone, it, it doesn't even matter if you hate sport, but if you watch Sky Sports, they will be obsessed with players' pass completion. So it's like, oh, pass completion's got to be above 95% for you to be a good midfielder. Um, and he started telling his players that their cut pass completion is too high. Um, and I was like, what? Yeah, that's interesting. Why are you doing that? And um, just like, you could, it would be like saying to Gemma, oh, happiness is too high. And the reason that he says it is when he sees someone who's got a 99% pass completion, he believes they're not taking enough risks on the pitch um, because they're just passing sideways all the time to, where they know that it's going to be a safe pass. Whereas... If you're ever going to score a goal, you've got to pass forward at some point. So with some of his best players, he's sitting them down and saying your pass completion is too high, which their football clubs hate where their managers are because they've got different styles, um, which is a, a, another thing about it comes up in our data a lot around managing multiple cultures within an organisation, which obviously happens if one player plays for separate teams. But in a freelance world um, and a move um, to autonomous, autonomous worlds, you have people working in different teams. Um, so it's just an observation and how I've seen Nicola, Gemma and, and Justin working in, in, in media, technology and a football uh, business. Mm. I think that, that links, Matt, if I may, just very quickly to the, the creativity angle and that ability to ask questions is not being afraid to because, you know, we try to promote that there's no wrong, you know, safe environments to be able to ask some questions. So there's no wrong question and there's no wrong answer. Um, as you're building, you know, you're building a strategy. Um, and one thing we did, um, I, I found this amazing guy um, on LinkedIn, actually, a magician called Bootsy. Um, he focused, so he, he uses magic to inspire people's creativity. And he starts off with um, remind, asking everyone, okay, so as a four or five year old, how creative were you? Everyone, hands up. And, you know, I can't ask everyone to do it unless you can't see you all, but... So pretty much the whole room has their hands up and then and then they see today how creative are you and it's like a third of the room at best put their hands up and it's it's all about actually things that have happened along the way how we let our own egos and the influence of others to prevent us from asking questions and from speaking out because you're conscious as an adult of how others will react to what you're saying Whereas as a child, it's, it's that wonderment. It's that you, you have that power to ask questions because you're not ever scared of how other people may, may react. And, and you lose that over time. And he's, he was a brilliant person that helped bring that back in and remind people that you should, you should be able to ask those questions. You should be able to make mistakes. You should, you know, you should, that should enable you to drive to the next level because no idea really is a bad idea, is it? It's, it's about actually getting to the, the solution from that idea. Because one idea I may have is, oh my gosh, Nick, that was ridiculous. But somebody may bounce off the idea I had to get to the, to the next idea and for it just to grow and grow from there. So it's a really good um, example, Matt, that you raised because you're right. Is it When you're measured to such an extent, are you then restricting yourself in your, in your creativity and in your risk taking? My, my, one of my first ever managers called me in for a meeting and, and started it by saying, Do you, I'm going to tell you what the problem with you is. <laughs> and, uh, and he said that I asked too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and then I answered it with a question, which probably made him even more angry. Um, and I said, why, why is that a problem? Can you explain why that is a problem? <laughs> he said, if you ask a question, people will know that you don't know the answer. Um, and the reason I t tell that story, one, it's funny, two, um, I, I held that advice for about a year. I thought it was good advice because he was senior to me. Um, and I think it's, it's really important that men, mentoring with a, not a capital M and I encourage everyone just to, like, the reason I know Nicola is because she sent me a random message on Nick, uh, LinkedIn saying, can we have a chat uh, and a coffee about happiness? 
So I just encourage people to just get out of their organizations and meet people that are just totally from different, different industries, different places, because you just get a different perspective. That was in one of my first roles. The only perspective I had was from that guy. And it wasn't until um, I went to work for the um, Guardian newspaper in London, that I realized that that wasn't the only way. <laughs> Um, so I would encourage, especially managers that have got young team members at the moment that are going to be working from home a lot, is try and, is, is try and hook them up with other people that you think that they can get a different perspective from. I mean, you know, the, w with all of those things, I mean, when you talk about, you know, even a young team, uh, a lot of the stuff that I find, especially having younger team members, is, you know, they're, they're quite driven, uh, you know, but their, their levers for, for what success is have changed a lot, you know, where, where before it was about having the, a nicer car or a bigger house or better clothes, you know, they are really wanting things like more time. Uh, they're wanting things like uh, flex, flexibility to do the things they want to do, to have a side hustle. You know, these, these are kind of things that they're, they're finding for success. And I'm finding myself being very receptive to that because I do truly believe that, you know, we, we have this existence and we have to kind of make our own way in all truth. And, and having people who aren't very happy in doing, you know, a job on a daily basis and, uh, and they can't work on the things that actually they feel make them who they are, it stymies creativity. It stymies curiosity. It, it stymies all of the areas of business that actually help businesses grow. So I guess like when I look at my life and think about success and happiness, you know, I, when I started, I guess my, my path was, was different to theirs. I kind of thought, oh, you know, I, I'd love to have a big house or I'd like to have a nice car, better clothes, more money, all of those things. But as I, what I found as I got older were the more I tried to Try well, the more I even either came into or tried to attain those things, the less happy I actually became. Um, and I, I still feel that way to this day. I, I don't feel any of the things I have in life actually have made me that much happier, except for in the moment, maybe when I was getting them, but then it, it fleets and it, it goes so quickly. I mean, I'd love you guys to, to, to chat about, let's chat about that a little bit more about, you know, your thoughts on success and happiness. Does success actually make you happy? Well, I'll just kick off um, and hand to the guys on this, Brandon, but there's, there's research in the book that, 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 that conclusively just shows it's the other way around. So where most people think that if you work really hard, get, do well at university, get a good job, you will become happy. The research flips it and says that it's the other way around, that if you are happy, you're more likely to be successful. Um, so I'll just hand, I'll hand to Jeremy and Nick that, but I just wanted to give the the background behind that for them to add some flavour. Yeah, well, I, I definitely agree with what you just said there, Matt. Um, it does work in multiple different ways. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the happier you are, the more likely you are to succeed, for sure. Um, but it can be that the more you succeed, um, it has other effects on you. And one of the things that we've seen in our uh, NHS research in particular, I suspect it's probably the same in other sectors, but I just don't have the data on that. Mm. that the more senior people get, um, in some ways their satisfaction does increase, but so does their stress. And of course, satisfaction and stress um, at some point will um, coincide and um, go up against each other and, and can lead to burnout. So um, I, I think that's that's the big danger um, with with success. If it's not managed well, um, then uh, people won't sustain it. The, 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 just the research to add to Jeremy, just two bits of research on Jeremy's points. One from Alex Edmonds in the book. Um, he did the 28 years of data um, that showed on the stock market companies with um, that treat their employees well, outperform those by times three um, every year. So not times three over a 20, um, eight year period, times three every year. Um, and he said on, because Jeremy's data is NHS, he said, I asked him what the biggest surprise in the data was. His biggest surprise is that it doesn't change per sector. So if you work in mining or you work in retail, the flow through to financial results um, is the same in every industry. He, he was quite surprised by that. Uh, the other bit of data is from Laura uh, Gierge, who I'm not sure if she's on here actually, but um, on that seniority point, she found that if you, um, if, you dedicate, if you apportion two hours 
a day, four times a week to what she calls proactive time, you can cut burnout in an organization by 6%. Um, so proactive time is where you pick your most important task, not your most urgent task, most important that's going to have the biggest impact. Um, and you switch everything else off, your mobile phone, um, Twitter, whatever it is, whatever the distractions are, and just focus on that task. Um, and by, by creating an environment where your team members can do that across the business, two hours a week, four days a week, you can cut burnout by 6% in her studies. So just wanted to add on to, to Jeremy's points with a bit more research. I'd, I'd love you really quickly, just to, just to kind of, uh, especially for people on the call, I'd love you to elaborate a bit more on what treating your employees well means. Because like, you know, if you, if you recall, there was a time uh, where I kind of lost my way with happiness, Matt, and you, you know, you and I, we had lots of chats, you know, which is, is usually quite rare for me. I'm normally quite naturally an up person, but, you know, being in a role with, uh, you know, very senior role, uh, lots of pressure, but, you know, all the things where the company gives you, you know, an expense account and you fly first class everywhere and you eat what you want and you drive a nice car and all of those things. And I was, I think you can attest to it, absolutely miserable. I pretty much hated everything about that entire experience. What does treating a company or treating an employee well, what does that actually look like? Um, I think for me, um, so I never met my granddad, but the thing that I got past about my granddad from my dad is that your role, whoever's in your team, and, th and this, this, the term sounds outdated now, um, but the term was that your role as a leader is to help that person better themselves, which I feel like is, is probably something from like the ninth, it, it sounds like quite like a class thing, like help them and people improve. But I think in the modern era, that, that is just development. And um, I think people forget, I think some people think that they own their employees. Mm. Um, and I just think genuinely, if people believe that you're looking after their own interests and Joe's on here, I reckon that this book is in the top 10 HR books because Joe's the cover. Because no one's read the blooming book, but it's gone in the top 10, but Joe's done an amazing job of designing it. It looks so cool. So if you go into the top 100, <laughs> um, if you go into the top 100 there's books there's books that have been designed that are grey <laughs> designed grey books sorry if your book's on here and it's grey um, uh, but I want Joe to work with me as long as he wants to work with me in the happiness index but if like if, if, if Joe gets like an offer to go to Netflix because um, like Joe and I are massive Cobra Kai fans just uh, anyone that's been watching that Oh yeah. But, but if Joe gets an opportunity and he and, and, and both he and I think that that's the best thing for his career, um, then that, that should be the right thing. But if I start saying to Joe, I don't think Netflix is a really great business, actually, just because I want to keep Joe because he's a good designer. I think ultimately people see through that. And so I see it as my job. Like we, we, we get offended when people call the happiness index a potential unicorn because we want to be something called a zebra. Um, so unicorns grow at, um, at the expense of anything, whereas a zebra, a, a zebra grows. Um, and one thing is, I hate to burst everyone's bubbles here, but unicorns are fictional, fictional and zebras are real. <laughs> um, and we want, to, um, we want to grow in like where we don't ruin the planet, where we build a community and so on. So if I use the example of Joe, I see it as my job to show them that you can get the best career development being with us. Um, but... If you're just saying that um, and not giving any evidence and showing someone that, I think people see through it. So to answer your question, I just think it's, are you genuinely interested in helping that person develop? Because I don't see employment as, as a contractual thing. I just see, I see most of the people on here as people that I work with, like Brandon and I don't have a contract with each other, but we're always working on stuff together. Um, so I just, I see it as a bit of an outdated way of, of looking things. And I just think people know whether you're actually looking out in their own interests. And I think if you are looking out for them, they pay you back in way more, um, that, than any other way of managing in my personal opinion. No, that's not data driven. That's my personal statement. Sorry, Nicola, I thought you were going to jump in there. Yeah. I'm, I'm just <laughs> conscious of speaking too much. I like to talk. I guess. Okay. Um, I, I would add, I would certainly add to that. And I think one of the things that 
I asked all of my staff to do again during during the tough times, but actually I would have done anyway is um, to get them to all revisit their their strengths. So I got them to go onto viacharacter.org or various strengths finders surveys just to to look at actually what are your core natural strengths and how much do you use those in your everyday roles and you know it's like the things that I've, I've raised today about my curiosity my need for continued learning all of these things actually help me to be happier they improve my well-being um, and so if I ensure that I use them um, throughout the week then it helps build me and build me. And I suppose that's part of, part of my career progression because your career is personal, somebody else um, has, has raised. That's your, it's your own career, nobody else owns that. Um, so so I, I asked them all to do that and to, to look at, at what, are your, what are your strengths? Are you using them? And it is really fascinating to do. And it's something that I would definitely encourage people uh, to, to look at and explore if they are working on ways to improve theirs or other people's well-being it's you know we've been most of us very fortunate to get into the roles we are in so it's like how can we help influence others to get them you know onto the career ladder or to progress onto into their next um dream roles or or, or progress in whichever way they so wish and and that's i think that's a big part of freedom to be human and and, and to help others to progress in the way that you have been able to, to progress yourself. So I would recommend that. It's something as part of the, the Science of Wellbeing course that um, that I did, which some of you, and it's some of you have, have um, done part of, but it's it's really it's really impressive um, and it's uh, it's really impactful as well. Uh, but number one priority would be to read Matt's book, of course, which is fantastic. <laughs> so well done, Matt. Congratulations. It's really um, really honored to have been part of part of your your journey on however small or large it's it's been really great to do so thank you thank you for inviting for inviting me to, to be a part of that i'm blushing um, nicola. <laughs> <laughs> i definitely um i don't i don't want you to disappear just yet nicola you're not going to disappear just yet are you you're going to no, hang not, not quite yet no <laughs> okay um just really quickly uh jeremy i just thought i'd ask you i mean i never want to discount you i naturally know you're a numbers guy figure data guy but you you clearly have some eq because you laugh at some of my jokes uh so <laughs> so I, i'd be interested in your take on on exactly what we were we were talking about i mean sure. do you do, yeah what do you how do you feel so um I think actually this is uh, where I can go back to what I said earlier about self-determination theory and the ABC um, of work. Um, I, it's not just work, but it applies particularly to work. So as an employer, you just need to make sure that each of those three needs is being satisfied. The, the need for autonomy um, so that people are in some control. Obviously, this is um, tailored to the particular circumstances they're in, as I explained earlier, but they've got some control over what they're doing, that they're belonging, they feel valued, that they, um, they know they're part of the organisation, they know that you're looking out for them, um, and competence, they've got the skills and ability to do what they need to do, and if they haven't got those, they get the support, they get the training, um, they get the mentoring, um, and actually, it was really interesting to hear you talk about mentoring earlier because that's something else, else I've looked at a bit, and um, it, it can work. It can work brilliantly both ways. Um, so one of the things that we in the NHS has best helped over recent years um, decrease incidences of unfairness and discrimination has been uh, reverse mentoring, when. Uh, senior managers who are disproportionately white uh, and predominantly male um, uh, are, are paired with people uh, from a more junior um, level of the organisation, uh, usually people of colour, who will um, then talk on a regular basis to share their experiences. So actually it works both ways and the people in the senior um, positions get to learn what it's really like on the ground. Um, now, from what you were talking about earlier, Matt, in the type of organisation that you're in, where you've got a small organisation, you've got good relationships, that kind of thing can happen automatically. It doesn't always, but it can. Uh, but in large organisations, that so often just doesn't happen at all. So the more you can put these things in um, so that people learn both ways, um, the more chance you've got of getting those conditions right. 
I think, uh, you know, sorry, just listening to you talk about the reverse mentoring and uh, obviously being a, a person of color uh, in corporate world, I have been through that, uh, that experience directly. And I'm only laughing because um, it was pretty as terrible as, uh, as it sounds, you know, it was, it was very much me being paired up with someone at the time more senior than me who maybe I don't know what it was. It could, it, it was likely more down to the person than the circumstance, but it was, I always felt more like he was trying to be my adoptive father than, than, than the other way around. And it, it never really quite took off. It always felt very unnatural. And, and as a result, it, it just, it just didn't work. And I, I've talked to other people uh, who, who've had, you know, similar uh, scenarios and that, and that probably speaks a lot more to, you know, society just needing to go a bit further, you know, you're never going to get it right on the day. It's great that at least, those conversations are happening. Um, I feel like in the current climate we're in that those kind of scenarios that may be in place now, I would hope they're making far more inroads than, than you know, maybe back when I did it. But just when you said it, I, so I apologize for the smile. It just, it made me laugh. It gave me a, a very, a very funny um, memory. Um, I'd, I'd like to just kind of take uh, the last few moments of, of the time we have uh, in this section, just to kind of go back to you, Nicola, and uh, you know, one of the things that's been burning in my mind is that you know you are very very well known for talking about the importance of curiosity in business so i'd just like you to just take us through that a little bit more um i think you know i briefly referenced um how gregerson earlier um and i think the whole curiosity thing is uh, and when i had the opportunity to, to chat with matt for his his podcast was was about asking questions and so often we feel like we have to know the answer. And, and as a leader, it's like, actually, you, you, you people look to you because they think you have all the answers. And if you look at the, from my perspective, the importance of having the right people in leadership roles is the ability to, um, to, to show your vulnerability, to acknowledge that you don't have the right answers all the time but you know how to ask the right questions to get to the right answers mm -hmm. and that's in then empowering your teams to 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 do the same because in doing that it also flattens that hierarchy because it's like you know what someone within our group the reason you are all employed um you by us for this company is because we we feel you have so much to offer and it it's that that's where that for me that's where that curiosity uh, the importance of curiosity comes from because asking more questions takes you to that next story it takes you to that next journey and you know for for, for creators um of entertainment uh, it, it, or anything you're, or you're doing you know the deep research that you do for very important stories that we tell that have a deep moral underpinning or an important message that you're trying to get across to to the world by being more curious in the way that Matt has done throughout his book, you, you're asking more and more questions. You're not just going, this is how it should be. This is what it is. It's, it's, and that's what everybody who has been involved in, in this book from what I can see and from listening to, to the podcast is that has, has done is whether as academics or as experts in their own fields is they're asking the questions or they're researching more to try and have a better understanding to get to the right next stage as part of, their own journeys and our journeys as as teams to to propel them forward and that's why for me that that value of, of questioning versus then just coming up with the the answers is is so important now at the same time you have to balance that with the fact that you know we have to communicate to inspire our people so we have to have our strategy we have to create that that purpose and that that level of meaning for staff so you have to obviously strike that balance as well give parameters but beyond that, let people let people grow through their own curiosity. They don't want to ask the questions. That's great, but they they want to be a part of that journey, and that's where their passion comes from. And that's how I think we we've, we've had the joy of building such great teams, not just internally but externally. The partners that we work with, you want to work together because we've built this um, this this awesome you know this this awesome group of people that want to build create more stories for the future. And for me, that's about creating, creating more questions. Fantastic. Well, um, look, I don't want to, I don't want to add to that in any way. Uh, I'd like to just leave it there if that's okay. 
Um, thank you so much, Nicola and Jeremy, for joining us for, for this, this portion and for sharing your views and your expertise. I feel like I've definitely learned a lot and gotten some great insight into this. And I can see that there are people popping things on the side saying thank you. Um, and, and I can see that people were asking a few uh, questions. Nicola, I can see you, you've answered the question about Lucy. Um, maybe just in case people can't see the chat when, when we do the recording, would you mind repeating Lucy's uh, yeah. details? Yeah, sure. It's Lucy Hon. Um, she's based in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. So if you just check her out, um, either type Lucy Hon TED Talks or just, just Lucy's name, she, she will, um, or Lucy Hon Resilience. And, and you will find her. She's really inspiring. I'm definitely going to look her up after this. I haven't heard of her, but she does sound inspiring. And yeah, thank you. Thank you both very much for your time. I'm just going to move into the last little bits here with uh, just a bit of Q&A in case any of you have any questions that you want to ask of Matt. Um, I can't see many things popping up. So I guess while we're waiting, Matt, I'm going to ask you a question because... Uh, <laughs> There was a piece in the book that really jumped out at me and it was about the, um, the set happiness. Uh, sorry, I can't remember the term. It was like a set level happiness. I think it was something like that. And, you know, you, you know, obviously I work in the CBD industry. And so one of the things with that is people constantly looking at, um, you know, taking, taking supplements or things like that to maybe help with their, their happiness. Um, you know, looking at that, it, it made me take a step back. You know, what if our body does have a set level happiness? You know, um, can, can, you, can you elaborate on that a little bit further? I mean, obviously without giving too much away in the book. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the, so the research is from Sonia Lemersky and because um, people always ask, is happy natural nurture? Because we're all big fans of Winnie the Pooh and we see Tigger and Eeyore and we wonder whether is, was Tigger born like that or was Eeyore born like that? Um, Sonia's research, um, she, she suggests her research says that 50% of our happiness is from our DNA. 10% um, is our circumstances, so that's our parents and, and where we live and so on. But for me, the, the most encouraging bit, and there's lots of leaders and HR professionals on here, is, that, is, the, is the next 40%, which is the way that we think, which is why I'm personally... Um, a big fan of some of the stoic philosophers that are in the book um, because st but long story short stoic philosophers I'm trying to like do like thousands of years of like philosophy all in one statement here but essentially what um what I take from it is that you should only really worry about stuff that you can control um and just to focus on the bits of your life that you can control and COVID is a really good example of that which is I had this long before the uh, Michael Jordan documentary um, came out, um, but I've always had on my phone, like number one image, which is a picture of Michael Jordan saying, turn a negative situation into a positive. Um, and I was always determined that um, when COVID hit that I would, I would use it as a positive. So I've, I used the time to get the book written that I wish wouldn't have had before. We released a new free product called Employee Voice. I mean, we built that in about two weeks. It was a cut down version of another product, but it meant that any company in the world could collect data on how, um, how their employees were feeling. So for me, it's that, that 40% um, that, that we all have to play for. That's what we can influence. That's what we can help our teams with on, on how, and, and when we know like all that research that says happiness impacts productivity, happiness impacts financial results, the stuff that Jeremy was just telling us about, so if we know that there's 40% of someone's happiness that we can influence, then actually we do have the tools in ourselves to help um, use happiness to not be a fluffy metric and actually drive the business. And, and, and one of my hopes long term is that people start reporting more of this stuff in the, in the board report. Just so people, people that don't know, companies in the UK, I, can't, I think it's about above 400 employees or something. It's a legal requirement as of last January that you have to um, include employee um, voice in your board report, which a lot of people don't know about, but I think it's a massive step forward. Um, so just, I just, I leave everyone with Sonia's research and just think you've got that 40% to play with. That's, that's, that's what leadership's about. Um, and it's, it's all that stuff that Nicola's talking about, how you inspire people, how you make them be curious and, and so on. So I'm always just trying to link the, the data with the story. 
I um I'm I I think when you feed it, I'm gonna ask you a controversial question because still no other. <laughs> again. Yeah, well well it's just I mean and I I I do, you know, it's 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 interesting to me, you know. I I look at happiness from my own natural feeling and my own experience as an environment. Uh and then of course, yeah, there are areas where naturally there are the chemical, the chemical aspect that, you know, influences yeah. whether you're happy or not. What about things like uh, I, I mean, I know quite a few people who've, you know, gone through depression and they've, they've struggled with depression and they have things, you know, uh, prescription medications that help to take the edge off or help them not feel so stressed. Um, what are your views on that in terms of, is that achieving a level of, of true happiness in, in your opinion? So a couple of bits science. So if you, as you joked at the beginning, Brandon, it goes right back to Confucius all the way up to like Lara Achnid and, and Laura Gersh now. Um, there's, they, if you read what all the philosophers say, they really talk about three types of happiness. They talk about mood, so up and down, which is why a lot of people confuse the happiness index with. They talk about um, flow, which is, you know, when you're just working in a team where everyone just knows what their roles are and you just perform your best stuff, whether that's you remember back to a team you were in at school or, or a team you've worked in. Everyone can rem Normally people can remember one where they weren't in flow. So normally people think about a team where it, it, it wasn't, but you can remember teams that you were. And like someone put something about the NHS in the thing about how, the, how terribly underfunded the NHS is, which I, I happen to agree with that point. Um, but also purpose, there's a, there's a level of purpose around happiness. So I think something like that, the NHS would probably completely collapse if there wasn't so many people in it that actually believed in what they're doing. Um, and that's probably the saddest thing, isn't it? When you get someone in the NHS that has gone into it because they want to help people and, that, and they give up and leave and, and go into something else. Mm. Um, so um, I, I would, what was it? What, I forgot the last bit of the question. <laughs> I just said, how, what were your thoughts around, you know, is, it, is that true happiness if somebody actually is yes. being enhanced by, by a prescription, for instance? Yeah, so that's the, one of the things I learned from the book is the, the definition between clinical depression and depression, um, which I think is really important for us to, to, to just call out here, which is if you're clinically depressed, going for a run um, or um, improving your diet or whatever, it's not, it's not going to help. You need to go to the doctor um, because there are, there are things that have gone on um, in your body or in your brain that you need to seek help for. Um, so we need to define the difference between clinical depression and um, feeling sad, um, which is all the things that are in the book around the, the example is the bacteria in soil that triggers serotonin in the same way that Prozac does. So that's, that's great. If, if, if Christopher Lowry was here, he would say, all oh, run outside now and get some, get some soil. And he showed me a video that some of his students did. It was a funny take on the research where they um, re-rigged a shower to just let soil come out of it. So people are like showering in soil. Um, <laughs> so I think um, the chemicals and understanding it are really important. And, and what I would say in a work context, why it's important is... Once you understand things like serotonin and, and all the other um, chemicals like dopamine, you start to imagine what chemicals you are triggering, triggering in your employees' heads when you speak to them or you put, put processes in place. So the one that I will um, call out is the word probation. So sometimes people spend a year trying to like headhunt someone and get them to come and work in their business. And then for the first three months, they put them on probation. <laughs> so... That may be a good idea, um, and I'm not arguing that, but the word probation comes from the Blooming Prison Service. So it's just a little, a little tiny bit of language, but subconsciously, when you get someone in on day one and you tell them, a document tells them they're on probation, you're probably not firing the right chemicals off in their brain. So once you start thinking about all these micros and chemicals, you start to look at the world a little bit different, and that's why I think education on this stuff... Um, I think it's criminal that people don't know about that people don't know about Jeremy's, Jeremy's research. Like the reason I asked Jeremy to kick it off today is that one of the questions in the book is happiness a fluffy metric. And in the book, I just present Jeremy's research and say, we should just end the book here because you shouldn't need any more than that. Um, but there are people out there that are going to say, well, I don't run an NHS trust. I'm not a charity. I've got to make money, which is why, um, 
Joe just placed up the happiness in humans community, which is, I just want the book to be like a catalyst to bring people together to start collaborating more so that we can get more academics, more entrepreneurs, more storytellers like Brandon and Nicola all together, just sharing more of this stuff. I love it. Um, you actually, sorry, uh, you, you actually did get a question as well. So I'm oh. <laughs> You actually, oh, you've got a double, it's like a double-ended question, Ooh. Ashley. She's like really going for it. I, I think her fingers might be sore. So oh, I'm that's, read that's, Mr. that's Mr. Ashley. Oh, oh, I'm so, apologies, Ashley. <laughs> well, <laughs> if I could see your face, I'd have known. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> so, so there we go. So the, um, the first, this is going to be in, uh, in, in multiple stages. So it'll be, no, Ashley, it'll be a really tough question. <laughs> <laughs> so the research shows that there are some core things that seem to make all the types of person happy or happier. Uh, but in a work context, are there different types of people or personalities who respond to different working practices in different ways to make them feel positive or happy? That's the first part of that question. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely there is. And we do talk about that. And the example I always use of that um, is identical twins. So even if you had two twins with the same DNA, um, if you know any identical twins, they're quite often different personalities. So the, it comes back to the nature and nurture bit. People are going to have different um, experiences in their life. Clive, um, who, um, it, as I said, um, has coached Chris and I throughout our careers and influenced the quantum bit, made a really good point on COVID. So everyone was different, a different person today than they were yesterday because we've had experiences since. Mm -hmm. um, but COVID has been such a fundamental thing um, that's happened to all of us. Every single one of your employees will have changed because of COVID. So like for me, exercise is really important in my happiness. I, I, can, I can go for a run or play football, play tennis every single day now. And I'm a, I think I'm a better dad for it and a better, um, better at my job. Um, and I won't go back. I'll go back and work in an office and stuff, but I won't accept that I can't do exercise once a day now. Um, so absolutely the answer is yes um, and we do cover that in the book and I, I use twin identical twins as an example to sort of illustrate that okay and, and so Ashley goes on to ask he says if so to to keep both types happy how do you juggle juggle or acknowledge them both I, I think that comes down to um, values again um, and one thing I, I really struggle with values is that you've got to be really careful that your values that values don't become a cult because it, it, values can somewhat, it's why I first loved it when I heard the New Zealand value, um, New Zealand rugby team value of don't be a dickhead. Um, like it's a brilliant value, isn't it? I was like, yeah, that's amazing. But if you take someone like Matt Stannard, who's our CTO, who's clearly not a dickhead, um, he just, that value makes him feel really uncomfortable because he sees that as you telling people how, that, how they should be. Um, so for him, that um, he, he would hate that value because we were joking. We were saying we should bring it in. Um, so it needs to be, it, it needs to be a, a set of guidelines around behavior and things like that. But once you start to like prescribe it too much, then you're just going to go back to Jeremy's point on, on autonomy, where suddenly you say you've got values, but really you're actually just telling people how to behave and who they should be, which is again, like I've, people get crazy when I say this, but I find it, and we're getting into, we could get into the surveillance bit a, too, a bit too much here. Um, but I find it really amazing that people are obsessed with how many hours people um, put in at work, but then, um, but, but then they, they, just, they just get too obsessed with the time at work as opposed to the output. Um, and I just, I, I find that incredible that they will try and get someone to be themselves, pretend to be someone else at work, which is taking so much emotional energy to maintain that effort. But then they're worried about whether someone's worked 9.5 hours or 10 hours in a day, but they're happy for them to work nine hours pretending to be someone else and effectively not performing the way that they, they in a way that could mean that they could add so much more value to the company. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, well, I'm not even going to add on to that. I just, uh, yeah, I'm, you're spot on. I mean, we, we, I, I think we have time for one more question, which is, is from Ashley yet again. Uh, <laughs> Ashley, there is a 10 pound note on its way to you. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, the last question for uh, just due to time. 
Ashley asks, do you have views on OKRs, objectives and key results, as a performance management framework used by Google and popular uh, among startups, or perhaps maybe too rigid or formulaic um, for con and constricting for happiness? Yeah, I think it, I, it's a bit of a cliche, but I think it's horses for courses, isn't it? Like, it depends on what you're doing. Like, like Jeremy said, you can't like say to surgeons, oh guys, you just, you just, you just cut that body how you want to cut that body today. <laughs> like in that example, you need some, you need some good instructions. Um, so I do think some of them are too rigid, but also it comes down to the ma the manager and the leadership and, and so on. Like work from home sounds great, but if you do work from home and then you expect your, you're putting surveillance on your employees' cameras, like, we had a debate about that the other day. I just don't think there's any argument for it. And when I've spoke to anyone in IT, there is pretty, there, there are ways that you can secure data remotely without having to monitor um, your employees. Like that's just cut and dry. So using the security question of data um, isn't a reason for surveillance. Um, but I'm slightly going off on a bit of a rant there, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I think, you know, just given the, the situation where we are on time, there, there were a few more questions that came in. Um, you know, it's, it's up to you if you, if you think realistically they're, they're actually coming in pretty quickly. It might make a little bit more sense if we, we save these and you can actually go back to, that, back yeah. to James, Kate, uh, James and Kate uh, directly, if that's, yeah. if that's okay. That. All yeah. right. Um, I, just, I just wanted to make sure to respect everybody's time. And, and thank you, James and Kate. Sorry that we won't, won't get to your questions here in the recording, but uh, Matt will come back to you guys directly. Um, Matt, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you very much for letting me be a part of this. This is, uh, I now can tell people I've actually like hosted a, a book launch, which is something I have never ever done. So it's been loads of fun. And I, I've enjoyed uh, learning as much as I have uh, from, from you, Nicola and Jeremy. You know, you guys have been brilliant. I, I love when I come away from something and feel smarter uh, and I feel like I can go to the, well, I can't go to the pub from Thursday, but I feel like, you know, I can, you know, talk to people and sound like I know what I'm talking about. So thank you very much. And Jeremy, I will definitely be using your slides and pretending like I did all this cool statistics <laughs> stuff to make myself look really cool. But um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you again for the experience. I, I'm, I'm very proud of you for the work you've done on this book. It is fantastic. I have read it cover to cover now. Um, and it, it is just, uh, it, it's excellent to, to be connected to somebody who's put so much passion into, into a project. And, and for any of you, uh, I, I would highly recommend that you do read this. And I think it will make you step back and take a lot of stock on things that you may have perceived or misperceived about happiness. So thank you very much, Matt, for that. Um, oh, by the way, I know you said no questions, but um, two things about Brandon that he won't tell you. One, like this is how talented he was. He was a running back in college football in America, which is not like university here where you get 10 people coming to watch you. Um, and two, Luke Knight just texted me saying, if, uh, I'll, pay, I'll put 20 pounds to charity. Brandon is also an opera singer. Um, like Premier League level type opera singer. And Luke said, yeah, um, and, and I'm going to make a segue into this, which is most men in the UK over 38 years old, we're, we're emotionally repressed um, and we struggle to talk about our emotions. And, and the evidence I want to give you on this um, is that if you ask most men are they over, over the age of 38 it, that are English to, to recount their, their one of their favourite memories, it will be World Cup 1990. But if you look at the data on it, right, it was the lowest, one of the lowest scoring World Cups of all time. It was a really boring World Cup. But the reason I think people, reson men resonated with it is because of number one, a man cried and that was okay, uh, Paul Gascoigne. Um, and two was Nissandora. Is it Nissandora? Is that how you say it, Brandon? Nissandorma. Uh, Nissandorma. Um, and, and it just makes that point on, on a memory and emotional. So. I'm not going to ask you to do it, Brandon, but if you record some later for us, I will send it round. Um, but I'm just going to, I'm not going to do an Oscar speech. I'm just going to say thanks to everyone that was involved. I have to call out Elle, Susan, Joe and Simas again as the core team and every single practitioner that allowed um, the time for me to interview them and the Happiness Index team um, for um, allowing me to just be a bit rogue and not come to internal meetings for a bit. That's been amazing. And um, Nicola, Jeremy and Brandon, you've been brilliant uh, today. And Brandon, you just need to become like a radio DJ or something. I feel more calm just listening to your voice. <laughs> 
Um, so that's it, guys. I just want to say thanks to everyone for taking um, the time out. Really, really appreciate your support. Um, if you want to continue the conversation, um, join the Happiness in um, the, Hap the Happiness in Humans community that Joe has linked because I just wanted this book to be like the fire under this stuff. I just wanted it to be a catalyst. Um, so I want everyone to just keep collaborating and, and moving this stuff forward. But that's me done. I really, really appreciate everyone coming to this this morning. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.